Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to talk about a few different topics in muscle research, and those are large mice, Hamlet and Romeo antibodies, and Western blots. And why those things? Well, it turns out they are all have a bunch of geek humor in them, of how they got their names. But to explain it, uh, I need to give you some background so you understand, you know, kind of how the jokes originated. And, and hopefully, by going through this, you'll not only get a good chuckle, but uh, you'll be uh, informed about these topics. So, with that, enjoy. So in a paper that I read several years ago, I saw a reference to the large mouse, and large was written in all caps like it is here. So I was wondering, okay, what is the large mouse? Uh, no, that's the large mouse, but not the kind we're talking about here. Uh, no, we're not talking about this kind of a large mouse either. Uh, so this is a figure that I showed in a previous video on the clinical trial of Ribitol on LGMD2I, showing the different genes that are involved in glycosylation of alpha dystroglycan. And one of them is called large, right here. And that stands for like acetyl glucosaminal transfer ACE. Um, now it turns out if you work out all the letters, you can't actually get the acronym large out of this name, but I'm guessing that this is actually a joke because the gene and the protein are indeed very large. Okay, and then not too long after, well, in fact, this is how the large mouse came around. They found a mouse that naturally uh, had a naturally occurring mutation in the large gene, which became named the large mouse. Uh, it isn't larger than a normal mouse. It's actually uh, somewhat smaller because its muscles don't develop very well. Okay, the second topic is Hamlet and Romeo antibodies, which are both antibodies for disferlin. Okay, uh, the disferlin gene was first discovered um, in 1998. Uh, it was known that there was a type of limb girdle muscular dystrophy called 2B, and they knew the approximate place in the genome where the gene was located, but they didn't know uh, exactly what gene was causing it or uh, much anything about the disease. Uh, so that was discovered in uh, 1998. And then shortly after that, the discoverers um, developed a, an antibody for the dysferlin protein. Now, the way you do that is you Gener uh, is you inject a um, sequence of about 20 amino acids uh, from the human dysferlin gene, either into usually a mouse or a rabbit, and then the animal will develop antibodies to that. Uh, after you purify the antibodies, then you have a uh, an antibody that you can use to test for the presence or absence of that protein in a biopsy. And, okay, so why was it named Hamlet? Well, you wanted to see from testing a person's biopsy for the dysferlin protein whether or not uh, they had LGMD2B. So the pun was um, 2B or not 2B, that is the question. So they named the antibody Hamlet. So some years later, the foundation that I work for decided to develop another antibody 
uh, for dysferlin kind of at the opposite end of the protein. And that's useful because uh, under some conditions, the protein can get cut up into two pieces and you want to be able to track where both of the pieces go by antibodies. Uh, so uh, my coworkers decided they want to keep going with the uh, Shakespearean theme, so then they needed to choose a Shakespeare character to name the antibody. Um, these are a few of the possibilities. Um, that isn't what it ended up being named. Um, it ended up being named Romeo. Uh, one of the choices was actually uh, Ophelia, uh, Hamlet's girlfriend in, in the play, which kind of would have made sense, but it became named Romeo. Uh, I wasn't quite sure why Romeo was the best name, but that was what um, you know, all the researchers that we polled voted on. Uh, my personal choice would have been Yorick, uh, just because uh, was kind of whimsical and also associated with Hamlet. Um, but uh, it was Romeo. Uh, the only connection I can really ha you know think of Romeo is about Juliet's um, soliloquy about um, you know how if Romeo had any other name than his real one, um, things would be a lot easier. Um, and about the, you know, ridiculousness of, you know, uh, calling something by a given name and assuming that, you know, that has some implication about, you know, who they are. Um, so, uh, to paraphrase Juliet's soliloquy, um, if we named LGMD to be something else, um, it would still be exactly the same. Well, uh, we now have named it something else, and it is exactly the same. Okay, so how are these antibodies used? And they're used in a couple different ways. Um, one is what's called immunohistochemistry. So you take a sample, in this case a muscle biopsy, and put the antibody in it. It binds to the protein and shows where the, lo the um, protein is located uh, within the cell. Now this compares uh, antibodies to two different proteins, uh, one for dystrophin, which is uh, responsible for a different type of muscular dystrophy. And then the dysferlin antibody, Hamlet, that was uh, in this article that uh, I just referred to earlier. So in a person who doesn't have muscular dystrophy, uh, both dystrophin and dysferlin are around the edges of muscle fibers. Uh, in a person who has dysferlinopathy, um, they still have dystrophin. Uh, but they don't make any dysferlin because they have a mutation in that gene. Okay. Now, the other way in which um, antibodies are used to detect protein is what's called a Western blot. And this uh, puts the protein in a gel on which you put an electric field. So the electric field causes the uh, proteins to move across the gel, but how fast they move depends on the molecular weight of the protein. So this shows the dysferlin protein, and you can tell its mass, uh, 230 kilodaltons, which is 230,000 times the mass of a hydrogen atom. And there's, uh, in lanes one and five, are samples from people who don't have muscular dystrophy. They have a really strong band. Uh, two, three, and four are from people who have a mutation in dysferlin and have um, dysferlinopathy, um, LGMD2BR2, uh, and have uh, very little staining in that band because they have very little dysferlin. 
Okay, now why is it called a Western blot? Um, well, to take a step back, uh, there was, um, uh, he's now emeritus, a professor at Oxford University, Edwin Southern, who developed a technique for analyzing DNA uh, with a gel, uh, you know, much the same as I just showed you. And so it became a, called a southern blot after him. Uh, a little bit later, someone wanted to uh, figure out a way of doing the same thing using RNA with RNA instead of DNA. And sort of as a joke, they called it a northern blot. Um, then later, they did proteins, so that became a western blot. And um, now there's an eastern blot, which measures uh, modifications of proteins uh, if they have sugar molecules stuck onto them, like uh, like what's going on in uh, LGMD2I, um, or phosphate, or lipids, all of these things can be uh, attached to proteins to modify their function after they're translated. Um, so they're all sort of puns on Southern's name. Okay, so to, to recap, uh, a southern blot analyzes DNA, northern blot analyzes RNA, western blot analyzes proteins, and eastern blot uh, analyzes modification of proteins. So that's, uh, they're all basically done in a gel and they can all uh, be used to um, measure the approximate uh, mass of a uh, DNA, RNA, or protein fragment. And in conclusion to this video, uh, I want to wish all of you a happy holiday season and a wonderful 2022, uh, wherever in the world you are. Best wishes.